Gracias por pressing play y welcome to Smart Chickens, a working together, smarter diversity meets innovation and growth podcast. In today's episode, we have a very special guest, Sergio Marrero, managing partner and founder of Rebel One Ventures. He is a serial entrepreneur, founder, investor, TEDx speaker, and coach who graduated from Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He previously worked at PepsiCo, Teach for America, and the Deloitte Consulting Strategy Operations Group. While in graduate school, he conducted his thesis on venture studios and accelerating impact innovation at the intersection of business and government. He set up operations for two funds, each raising $100 million, produces a VC and CEO live stream series called Rebel One Live, and is managing director of Rebel One a double bottom line investing fund and investor network accelerating rebels innovating for a better world. We have a very real and candid conversation around his views of VC funding for both investors and founders of color. Um, but we also talk about the lack of diversity and the low percentages of access to funding that many founders of color encounter and how his programs are helping to change those numbers. He gives us some of his book recommendations to get 1% better, and he shares the advice he would give a younger Sergio Marrero if he could go back to the future. As always, this podcast is brought to you by our good friends at digitechie.com, a conversational marketing demand gen and revenue accelerator consultancy, helping B2B companies achieve six to seven figures in pipeline consistently. And gypsyforever.com, uniquely handmade wellness products to help you connect your mind, body, and soul to achieve a better balanced you. So, vamos, let's dive into the show, and without further ado, here's Sergio Marrero. Sergio, welcome. Good morning, and thank you for being part of this podcast. Smart Chickens is a podcast dedicated to diversity in thinking and how it drives innovation and growth. So, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for making the time. Yeah, no, I, li likewise. And so, I, I found you... In, you know, via way of LinkedIn. So we, we know each other virtually for a minute now. And uh, I, I found it very fascinating that you had some interesting conversations for TEDx around, um, you know, is, is a degree worth it? Um, as was one of your, I think, uh, kind of uh, 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 presentations. But more importantly, you know, you've had a very interesting uh, background around the VC community. And uh, I'd love to be able to, one, learn a little bit about your own background. What's your origin story? Because I think it always starts there, right? So if you could, for our listeners, what's your origin story? What's your background? Yeah, sure. Where'd you grow up? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. So um, my background, uh, I am uh, by heritage Puerto Rican, but born in, in New Jersey. Uh, my, my parents both grew up in, 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 in New York um, and raised in, you know, uh, household was uh, first um, you know, in, in New Jersey, but then ended up going going off to college, and um, and it was first my family to go to a, a four year college, and um, and in that journey, did engineering, did you know, and and, and shifted around quite a bit, and um, it wasn't until I I went off and 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 I was like, you know what, I want to start. I always wanted to start my own business. That was the like, you know, the the goal. Um, my my uh in my family the the entrepreneurial journey was more um around my dad uh he was a musician or is a musician and oh, um you know saw the hustle of of building something beautiful but but in terms of finances sustaining that for uh sustaining finances for and a musician is, is tough right that that creative and i think um in a lot of parallel being an entrepreneur is similar right you're creating something from scratch uh and you know, you're, you're, you're building something from nothing, getting it off the ground. Um, and you know, you're balancing that creation and, and also, um, wealth generation, but, um, went off to Northeastern studied industrial engineering, um, then left, uh, and I worked at, uh, PepsiCo, then Deloitte, um, in, um, strategy and operations. So, so kind of typical path in my mind, I was like, I'm going to go to business school and then start a business. Um, then end I ended up, um, you know, really being touched by some uh, service work I was doing relating to um, education, access to education, and realized there may be a business opportunity there, but also um, the need for people who couldn't afford or didn't understand um, 
you know, like what the impact education could make. Um, and I was like, how do we make this more affordable? Right. And I saw people in my family. I was the first, since I was the first to go to a four-year school, I saw the impact it made on me. And it's that, how do we engage more people in this community? Um, you know, that led me to go to Harvard Business School, the Kenny School of Government, and really focus on impact innovation. And the more I did that, the more I understood that the system is built for um, a few to succeed, a few can afford it and a few to succeed. Um, and while it does work in, um, it is a, uh, it is not meant for the masses, right? It is not meant uh, as a system that works for everyone. Um, and I think that's where, um, you know, when, when I ended up doing that research, working on several um, ed tech startups, uh, many of which failed, right? And, and I think that's what people miss. They're like, oh, you, you know, end up doing the TEDx talk and talking about the degree is dead. I was like, no, no, I, I went to all these institutions, worked for, you know, over a decade of time, um, and then things weren't working. And I was sharing that um, not only the failures, but the but the but what I gleaned from from that journey, um, and I would say that journey is not over. Uh, you know, I, I very much um, you know focus on making an impact, making a difference in in the you know even in the work that I do today at Rebel One. Um, so you know, uh, so I'll, I'll I'll pause there, and you know, I'll, I'll yeah, let no, you. No, 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 great. <laughs> that, no, that's that's great, and and thank you for sharing that. So, <clears throat> I think for our listeners, right, because I'm really trying to target. Um, you know, entrepreneurs as well as young, um, the young generations coming into the workforce amid a global pandemic, which is going to be a little bit tough for, um, you know, for even a seasoned entrepreneur to, to see how to navigate through these un, un, uncharted waters. What's sort of been your, your perspective um, when you think about, let's say, the VC community, right? We know Silicon Valley, um, you know, over the last few months, has had to make some some changes in their way of thinking about some of the startups that they're, um, you know, um, that, they, that they have in their portfolios. So, for example, you know, um, SoftBank, um, Mar Marcelo Claude, the the chairman of the board for SoftBank, and, and he's a great story. You know, Bolivian American came to to the U.S., uh, went through Bentley College, um, and then started his business uh, through Motorola. After Motorola, the, the Brightstar Corporation, and you know, you fast forward and he's the chairman of the board and ex-CEO of Sprint. But they, they were the, one of the first companies that I saw on LinkedIn that actually put a $100 million fund towards people of color, POC, right? So when you're talking about this, this sort of dynamic of here's the educational system, it is what it is. It's a bit broken. It works for, for just a few, not to the many or the masses. And now we're in the situation we're in in terms of this global, you know, uh, recession slash the pandemic. How do you see companies... Uh, reacting to getting VCs to look at the two percent that is going right now to minorities, um, you know whether that's you know uh, people of color or or women, how is that changing or how has that this this actual you know this state of time let's say changed that a bit? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I I think I think the global pandemic has just made it. Um, uh, you know, put a lot of pressure on on a number of businesses, no matter where what background you're from, to and, and investors to focus on cash, uh, and and to simplify the that message a little bit more and to explain the why, right? As a uh, as an investor, right? Like looking at a business to to invest in a in a basically a person or a team that's starting a venture that has not made revenue, has not launched a product is extremely risky. The, yes. the rate of failure is in the 90 plus percentage, you know, a, a rate at that. So, and then also um, because the, the uh, market has, has tanked, there's, there's businesses that are making money. They have a product um, and, and, and they're generating substantial revenue over time that because um, let, well, let's say some of the real estate, companies, right? Or, or um, you know, or, uh, it, and I'll use that as an example, they may have experienced short-term cash needs um, and be willing to give up um, probably a larger uh, stake because less people are investing. So when you look at investing in a company that is an idea, you know, I'd say a team and a dream versus a company making money, but they're cash strap in a, the short term, but, but, um, there's evidence, right? There's it, by when I say evidence, uh, it's customers actually paying for something, um, sure. and and it, you know that's where you're going to put your money. Um, and uh, so so that uh, that's happening now, and it's it's really tough. And and 
Um, you know, I think for communities where they don't have family that they can just lean on and depend on and, you know, um, kind of go home to or borrow money from, um, a lot of those businesses are, businesses are just shutting down and it's, and it's tough. So I think the thing that we can do right now is vote, I say vote with our dollar. Um, look at those small businesses, give them um, business if you can, you know, um, I'm not saying it's not a donation, but it's, it's buying goods and services from them um, to keep them alive right now. I think that's, and then, you know, and, and then hopefully after, you know, I, I think that's uh, one thing. On the VC front, venture capital, I think it's a, it not, it, there's a, a layers of that. So one, not every business needs venture capital. Venture capital is a very specific um, uh, type of investment where they're putting in money and the expectation is they're getting, you know, 10x, 5x back. Yeah, they, their money back, which means you need to be a high growth business in order to do that. Not if you're starting a bodega down the street and you don't intend to scale that in any capacity, you're not a high growth, high growth business. That doesn't mean that an investor wouldn't invest in you, an angel investor, right? So, um, you know, and, and it's just understanding that. And it doesn't mean it's not a, a great business, right? Like that's, I think that's a misnomer as well. So just understanding like what type of entrepreneur you are and what type of investor makes the most sense for you. Um, and then the other layer that you talked about is like Latinos in, in venture. And, you, you know, um, it, it is, there are such a small number, you know, we, we make up, uh, you know, about 16, I think almost 17% of the population, according to the, the um, you know, the yes, census yes. data and, and, you know, Latinx versus Hispanic. I'm not going to get into the, the nomenclature, but, but that's about the, um, you know, about the allocation. Uh, well, the, the representation in terms of percentage, um, the, uh, the, the black community makes up about, I think, 16%, 15.6, I think was the last number I, I saw, um, you know, even together, uh, you know, don't, don't have equal representation in terms of the asset allocator. So something we look at is, is 1.3%, I believe, of, of uh, asset allocators. And what I mean is the people that are deciding where the money goes, uh, that are leading hedge funds, that are leading mutual funds, that are leading venture. So I'm looking beyond venture because venture is a very thin slice of the, the investment community. Um, only 1.3% are uh, people of color. That is bananas. Like that, that is unacceptable. Um, we talk about um, generational wealth, uh, and we're in, if we're in denial about that, um, just look at the numbers, right? Like numbers don't lie. So, um, or they, you know, they can be misconstrued, but, but in looking at that, we just have a lot of work to do. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of, you know, I can go on about the different ways to do that, but my focus has been specifically in having gone through all these amazing institutions, having cut my teeth as a founder for 10 plus years, um, you know, lived on, uh, slept on couches, uh, couches of, of, of graceful friends and, um, you know, slept on mattresses on the floor and, and done all these crazy things, taking mm -hmm. that learning, codifying it um, so that one, other founders don't have to invest and, and go through some of the same pain. And then also people that are people of color, color and want to start, I say, vote with their dollar, right? They want to invest um, that, that they can learn that um, through Rebel One. And that's what we're trying to do at Rebel One. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and it's fantastic that, you know, you've taken on that kind of that, um, that cumulative experience and are helping people in the, that are wanting to get into the VC community. Um, not trip through the same kind of pitfalls that, that, that most startup founders have. And now, so when you were talking about the, the um, just now about, uh, you know, the sort of the landscape we're all in, um, you know, what do you think about back casting? So, you know, Michael James Jr. at a floodgate had an interesting concept called back casting, which is kind of looking at a company five years into the future. But from that point, looking at what you need to do to be able to kind of be successful as a company, right? So these are the VCs that, these are the companies that are probably maybe in the knowledge economy, right? More in the tech sector, I would presume, that already have some positive ARR and are looking at how are they going to uh, survive the next, you know, three, four years. If, if you had to think about, you know, maybe a, a Latinx founder that's got a company that sort of fits that criteria, what should they be thinking about or how should they be approaching 
what they can do in, in this uh, moment in time? That's a great question. I, I think that in order, I think for all businesses, I don't think it's unique to Latinx, but um, I'll say you, I'll say people of color in general, but also Latinos is, is thinking about um, two things. One is like, what is your superpower? So what, uh, what, uh, and that goes in terms of knowledge and experience, but also in terms of network. So um, even myself, uh, we do a lot of training, ends up being, um, you know, a, a, a high amount of people of color taking the, the training program because they are familiar with, um, you know, the, the content we do and, and they trust it. Uh, and it's, it's great. Like we're, you know, I, I feel um, humbled to, to have, you know, become to build this network. It's not only for people of color, but it's, it, we tend to have, um, you know, a large representation um, in, in, in our group. Um, but if you're, uh, if you're a founder right now, um, you know, I think if you've, let's say you've gone to, so I've made this mistake, I'll share um, with you. I think you come out of a business school and you learn what they teach you and you drink the Kool-Aid and you're like, I'm going to start a startup and you start it and you just get into this um, build at all costs, you know, mentality or, um, you know, growth will solve the problem, right? Like meaning that your unit economics don't work, meaning that like you're, you're spending more than you're making at the simplest level. Um, and that you're, you said, oh, when I get to a thousand people, it'll be sustainable. Um, you need to figure out from day one how to make a profit on, you know, the unit you're selling. And then you need to figure out how to uh, grow responsibly, like how to not, it's, it sounds funny, but right now is like, think like you need to be as durable as a cockroach <laughs> on one side. Uh, and then also with the, with the it, it, mindset that you're like, okay, when I win, right, I do get that, that break, that investment, that, that revenue, um, you know, these are like, how, how do, how might I tend to a hundred X what I'm doing uh, in, in a certain way? So I think that's the toughest part. I think coming from communities um, of uh, where, where resources are constrained, that, that, uh, we're in the mindset that we have to just, we squirrel away funds and we don't spend them. We need to bet. We need to continue investing um, in, in ourselves and, in, in, and we have to try certain things in order to grow, grow what we started. I think that in the beginning is usually the toughest part. It's like one, not, not um, almost in, like thinking like cash from the beginning is king. And then when we do get that first investment, um, thinking about what can I spend it on to really, um, you know, have uh, some some breakout growth. Right, to accelerate the growth from that. So reinvesting is what you're saying, and our community could do better. So Damien Rivera, who's uh, the CEO of um, Alpha, um, you know, the Association for Latin Professionals in America, he had an interesting uh, conversation with me just recently and talked about how in the Latin, uh, you know, uh, the Latino community, that there are some, you know, pillars that, that need to be discussed. You just talked about it right now, like just so generational wealth. So their concept is also on training or having these pillars where, where wealth, uh, you know, kind of wealth management. So after not only having your domain ex ex expertise, which is to your point, you get that through education, you get that through kind of cutting your own teeth when you're either working for a business and are sort of the entrepreneur within that business or have your own business. But what would you say for, for those founders and maybe even for those young professionals that are about to graduate what they could do to, to kind of get that, a bit more of that experience. What was your experience, for example, when you were at the Deloitte of the world, Johnson & Johnson? I mean, you've had incredible companies that you worked with, uh, you worked at, I'm sorry, and now you're representing founders, but what would you say are some things that they could do to kind of prepare themselves for, for this? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the, the amazing things now is that uh, the cost of experimentation and starting is is very low, um, and uh, even what we're building, like we're building a, a a platform so that you can learn venture investing, right? Instead mm -hmm. instead of oh, well investing, and then also we're we're starting to experiment with founder training, uh, so that you don't have to spend years like the at the average or early stage entrepreneur spends about thirty grand uh, yeah. in about three years, um, and and ninety over ninety percent of that is lost, you know, in terms of failure. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is is ask ourselves how do we speed that up how do we in in about 
three to six months time, you have the same amount of learning for a fraction of the, the cost. You're talking about something in the order of, um, you know, about uh, less than a thousand dollars, right? So, so um, that's things that, that we're trying to do. Um, for them, what I would say is, um, don't is experiment now um, within your means uh, and and um, uh, give an example of, of a framework we talk about uh, you know, prototype um, we talk about pop-up and we talk about pilot and that's just like one framework that comes out of our our founder training so if you have a concept let's say you want to start a bakery right like it, you know, first is, is prototype. Like, how can you sketch it out? How can you bake the goods you intend to bake? How do you like do the things so you're and offer them to people, see if they will buy them so that you're pro once and once they buy them, only then do you have evidence that that actually works. Right. Um, you know, next you talk about pop up. Could you actually, you know, you see what the sample of a pop-up is, is a, a baker, you know, bake, bake shop now in the time of COVID individually wrap things and, and sell them on a subscription online. without, without, and then you don't need to spend any money on a store. Then, you know, like, like that's, that's it. And you could do that for a period of time. You could pilot it. Pilot is like sustainably offer it to a limited community. Um, mm -hmm. So you could do that within a geographic region. Um, and then the next step is, even without a store, right? Like you have sure. virtual uh, online kitchens forming. So that's an example of like a simple concept as a bakery and how you would break it up. You don't need to save for years and then buy a location and mm -hmm. then um, and and then all of a sudden when you buy the location, you realize, you know, in doing your break even analysis, which is something we do, you have to sell five hundred muffins a day in order to break even, right? Like sure. you sure. just. In, in, in the bit like doing all those experiments right thinking mm -hmm. uh lean from the beginning and um you know building uh to to that the build and test um all, all those pieces is is what i would recommend now is like uh think small act every day um keep that you know long vision um but but you 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 need to think about how to get cash in the door very early did you just and and another caveat I will say is like, especially for people of color, all the time they're like, oh, like I think some, no, I'm not saying all, some people have this, oh, poor me. I'm a person of color. Uh, I statistically don't get um, a, a lot of investment. And I said, let's do some math, right? If if one to 2% of, let's say 1%, make it easy, right? 1%, one of that out of every 100, um, you know, uh, dollars that goes into venture investment goes into women and people of color. And then for every one investment um, an investor is making, they're looking at anywhere between on the low side, a hundred, on the high side, a thousand, like let's talk about, let's say 500 deals. So for that one deal, they looked at 500 times the hundred, they looked at 5,000 deals to, to make one deal in a, in a, you know, like anywhere from a, 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 a 5,000, a thousand to 5,000 deals to make one investment in a person of color. What I would say is how about you talk to a thousand customers? How about you talk, like even a fraction mm -hmm. of that? Um, yeah you one will get the best investment you've gotten which is non-dilutive investment your best investor is your customer right you would get yeah. the best investment you've gotten you don't have to pay it back you pay them with the product that you're intending you get evidence that what you're actually doing works and if you talk to even 100 people and they don't buy maybe you have to pivot and change your idea and th and those are that's what i tell founders of color you know i was like anchoring your customer um anchoring your customer i'm not saying don't talk to investors you should definitely do that um but no Knowing that, um, especially in this environment, uh, and, and if you do not have the privilege of having networks of wealth, um, be honest with yourself and, and, and think that this is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> right. No, I love that. Those are really great insights and points. So really think, think that, that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, look for your anchoring your, your, your customers as kind of a way to sustain yourself uh, through, through, this, uh, through, through these times, right? These sort of thin times. Um, now, when, when thinking about success, they say that it comes at the intersection of preparation meets opportunity. What was that moment like for you? Because, you know, uh, outside of obviously your education, now you, you've got Rebel One, um, you're helping founders, you've got great programs, I was on your website, and you've got a great clientele base. But what was that moment where you kind of had that intersection of opportunity meets preparation that got you here? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I 
the entrepreneurial journey, I will start saying is like definitely humbling. Uh, and uh, when I first went into Harvard Business School, uh, I, I said, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to spend I'm going to I'm going to spend the next several years building a business. I'm going to leave and I'm going to be doing that business. So what happened is as I started uh ended up getting investment uh or like small investment from Startup Chile, it was around 20k, yeah. we ended up going to South America um and and building out the business and in a very short time we built an application, didn't get the user traction, didn't focus on revenue, didn't get the revenue we needed, and we ended up running out of money um because we were burning it much faster than than we were um you know, uh, generating it. And, um, and I was a mess, right? Like I spent, uh, I was, you know, almost pretty, pretty much broke. I was, you know, I backpack around South America, staying in hostels. I was so stressed. My hair was falling out. It was, it was crazy. It was like, like, you know, t total, total, um, you know, uh, it felt like I was reading a, a, you know, a case about someone else, right? Uh, a, a story. Um, and then uh, coming out of that, um, I said, what are the things I have to do to, uh, you know, do this again and do it better? And I spent the next several years working at a venture capital fund, working at uh, an innovation consultancy, uh, and then ended up going back um, to to uh, Harvard Business School um, and uh, trying again. Uh, we built a business, another one. We were on the path to piloting with, uh, was, it was selling to employers. We were doing learning, right? This is before I did the Degree is Dead uh, TEDx talk. And uh, our team was in Puerto Rico. Uh, Hurricane Maria came during that time. Um, and we didn't have too much money. It put us in a position of spending either the rest of the money um, after, you know, devastated and, um, you know, the, the island of either spending the rest of the money moving the team off the island or um you know or returning the money to our investors uh thinking about um and then helping get everyone jobs and really shutting everything down and that's what we did um and that was tough you know that was like another like brutal failure that we couldn't of like the business failed but we didn't fail right like that's a right. important thing yeah. but but in knowing you just can't you can't see everything and you have to think about how do you go the distance um you know, and then, so that's what I'm saying. I don't think for entrepreneurs, I don't think the struggle ever ends. Like even now, um, I ended up joining a venture capital fund, uh, a, f a fund that was starting up. Um, I was doing founders training. They asked me to take my founders training, turn it on its head and train investors. I did that. I learned how to invest, did about 15 deals while I was there and then said, this is amazing, but it's very expensive and in person. I think that there's an opportunity to scale this. Um, so I began testing. Um, and over the last year, I would say two thousand end of 2018 was a concept. 2019 was a lot of testing. Um, and then really uh, pushed Rebel One the beginning of this year um, and have done well. But it's been, um, you know, t uh, all, all over a year of doing it as a side hustle, right? I, I tell people I, I it was the side hustle that became the hustle. Uh, and um, to close sales is, you know, every day, like talking to people, telling them like, you know, I, I telling them this is, you know, even though I know that this is the best venture capital training there is out there, like I yeah. can, like at a, at a, I can say that with confidence, like Correct. integrating, uh, thank you for integrating Harvard Business School cases, like putting theory to practice, enabling people actually to, to invest. We have over, you know, 200 videos codifying things that you would need to be a founder, have gone, spent six figures going to a top MBA school to learn yeah. in, in a, in, in a 10 week period, like that, you know, we've had people in Harlem Capital and Pipeline Angels take our course and say that is a notch above, that it is like the best learning, and, you know, like, and so we are confident um, that there's a step function, um, you know, for the for the price that we charge, it's a fraction of, of all those. Yeah, and the time yeah I, love, I, I love that because like, I noticed that you're dem democrat democratizing a bit that yeah. whole process of the, the learning experiences and the yeah. programs that you have because you can't compare, you know, the pricing of an MBA or a Kellogg's, you know, MBA program on, on VC to what you're doing. And yours comes with, we've been there, done that. It's more practical and not just theory based. So, so yeah, no, I, um, I think it's great. And I, and I think that, you know, it's, um, it's very timely as well, I would say, because we don't know what this pandemic is going to um, uh, 
mean in the next three to five years, right? Uh, we're still trying to get a grasp of it, right? I mean, as you know, Congress just recently had um, the top five tech companies um, meeting uh, um, at, uh, at, the, uh, at Capitol Hill to talk about uh, potential antitrust and monopolies, which, which it sort of baffles me, but at the same time, I understand that we're living in a moment where people are seeing this sort of generational equity divide that has now been uh, brought even more to the surface, right? Mm -hmm. Because of what we're going through. So I think though that this is the opportunity if we could kind of take from a saying that it says, you know, you know, um, necesidad es la madre de invención. So necessity yep. is the, you know, uh, uh, invention is the, the mother of necessity. And I think because of that, I think people that are in positions like yourself, right, with Rebel One and the offerings you're providing are perfect for this moment in time, right? There's going to be um, a lot of innovation. Yes, there's going to be losers and winners, right? And for, for unfortunately, that is just the, the way it's gonna it's gonna pan out. However, for those that uh, have, you know, already put a, a proof of concept together, that have already maybe had some failures, because I think success is only you know only comes from failures, right? So you've got to fail like like to to put it in a basketball term, Michael, <clears throat> you know, Michael Jordan failed many more times at his free throw shots uh, than than making them, right? And yet he's probably one of the most you know, uh, incredible uh, historic players in the NBA, right? So I love that you're talking about that too, that this is a conversation about Gianni, uh, you know, for my for your listeners, these are all the failures that they should expect to have and should have because those healthy failures are only gonna make them better. You know, it's like you get that Absolutely. 1% better each time, right? So this is great. So for for people that, um, you know, I like to have fun with my, with, my, with my guests and I tell them, you know, quarter, Monday quarterbacking is always fun. You know, rear view mirroring is always fun. So I don't know if you're a fan. I'm on the fourth floor. I grew up in the 80s. So for me, one of my all-time favorite movies was Back to the Future. And so if you could jump in uh, with us in the Back to the Future DeLorean with Marty and go back and talk to a younger Sergio Marrero, uh, what advice or what would you say, if anything? I would say start now. That's it. I think that uh, – and. To give more color uh, around that, I, I talked about the startup failures. I didn't really, I didn't know what a VC was until I went to grad school. I didn't start, actually start, uh, try to start businesses until, um, you know, I, I made it to a certain plane. And, and what did I learn when I got there? That you only learn by doing, you got to start sooner. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean quitting your job and I mean there's a responsible way to do it right you can sure. start a side hustle but uh specifically in entrepreneurship there's there's your there's not a um there are books and programs to support you but you need to just start so i would say right. start sooner is what i would have told myself all right that's good and now i i'm a firm believer uh, sergio that uh you know leaders or readers and entrepreneurs can learn from others and books are one way you know if you could recommend um three books, let's say, or, or books that you've been actually um, impacted by and, and have read or are thinking about reading because of recommendations, what would those be? No, that's a good, that's a good question. I'll, I'll do one that's, uh, I'll start with one that's light, but, uh, or uh, an easier read, but uh, uh, fiction uh, is uh, uh, The Alchemist. Um, read that in college a long oh, time ago. No, I love that. Def definitely moving. Um, I would say more recent on the business side, um, originals um, is is excellent uh, in in uh, Adam Grant um, in really breaking down, um, you know, like what uh, how you know wh when original thinking works, when can it be challenging, how to do it in organizations, how to do it independently. Um, that's been great. Uh, and uh, another one that um, I would say there, there's one I most recently read uh, is uh, Be Becoming um, Michelle Obama. Um, I would actually recommend the audiobook for that one because she actually reads it, uh, which is really uh, a special experience of having, you know, a first lady read her story to you. Uh, so, so those are, I would say those three. Oh, oh, that's great, man. Those are great choices. Yeah. And she's got her Netflix on, on Becoming as well, her special. But yeah, so th this is important. I think that, you know, a collective knowledge and sharing that collective knowledge, which is what, is what you're doing with Rebel One, is one way to do that books as well as, you know, putting in programs like the ones you're doing for folks that are founders or are trying to get into the VC community. So this has been, been great. For, for those who want to reach out or follow you or to, um, to connect with you, what are, their best, what are the best ways they can do that? Sorry, oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I would say there's two uh, ways. One, personally, you can 
uh, find me on LinkedIn, Sergio Mar Marrero. Uh, and then also, if you are interested in hearing more about Rebel One and how to, you know, in invest or, or or launch as a founder, um, go to rbl1.com uh, and and sign up for our newsletter. So uh, those those are the two ways: LinkedIn and and rbl1.com.